Hawks a blowout, eighth inning, 10-3. The bases are loaded for Verlander, who waits out a great finish. He swings, and it's a high fly ball, deep center field. It is gone, home run, and a huge bat flip to celebrate. All right, Ben, start the show already. What's up, everybody? Welcome into the first episode of the week of Flippin' Bats. What a week it was. We have a ton to cover. Of course, all the best storylines from around the week, as well as power rankings. It is the first of the month, actually. April is done with, so we'll do updated power rankings and some April awards. MVP of April, Cy Young, Rookie of the Year, all that good stuff. And of course, my favorite segment, this week in Shohei Otani news. What a week it was. Producer Conrad is out here to join me again. Producer Conrad, what a week, my friend. What a week. Yeah, great week for baseball. I mean, you got to have a fantastic weekend going to check out some of these Dodger Detroit games. Saw you I were did. on the field with Miggy beforehand, and you got to see a cool game <laughs> last night. Let's talk a little bit about Clayton Kershaw. Yeah, so I, I was out at Dodger Stadium. This past weekend, my, my friends are in town. The Tigers were there. Had to, had to go see all the guys and say hello. So I was there the first two games of this series, actually, and got to catch up with Miggy, got a sick picture with him. The GOAT less than a week after he got his 3,000th hit, by the way. And uh, the Saturday game was just that – was, that was the Clayton Kershaw game. They, the Dodgers ended up not winning that game, but, but that didn't matter. That day was about Clayton Kershaw. Kershaw officially broke the all-time strikeout record for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Unbelievable. 2,700 strikeouts now for him. The record was 2,696. He needed four on Saturday, and he got it. I was there in attendance to see it. It was incredible, and and it was special to see that. And, And hats off to Dodgers fans. Hats off to that crowd, that stadium, the team, the Tigers in their dugout. It was a special moment. And Clayton Kershaw caught the ball after the final strikeout, which was to Torkelson, friend of the pod. Didn't love that, but loved that he got the strikeout. And wanted to get right back out on the mound, but he gets the strikeout. Nobody gets, the catchers keep standing, the batter keeps standing. Nobody would get ready. So it forced him into acknowledging everybody took his hat off. The place was going nuts. The all-time leader in strikeouts for the Dodgers. Absolutely incredible. He's now 3-0 and on the year with a 2.35 ERA through, three start, through four starts. I mean, this is Clayton Kershaw of old that we're seeing. He passed Don Sutton for the record. But get this, Sutton needed 3,816 innings to do it. 3,816. Kershaw did it in 2,477 and two-thirds innings. That is wild. Breaking the record in well over a 1,000 less innings. Man, Clayton Kershaw is an all-time great, continuing to do all-time great things. I got to see it there on Saturday at Dodger Stadium. That was special. He's one of only two players active in Major League Baseball that leads his franchise in strikeouts, by the way. Um, Steven Strasburg being the other. Really, the only other chance to do it is Jermon Marquez of the Rockies, who needs, he could do it this year, later this year. I believe he needs, he needs about 150 to do that. But if that happens, when and if that happens for Marquez, we're not going to see it for a long, long, long time. This is a big deal. The Dodgers are one of the most storied franchises in the history of the game. And I got to see him break that all-time record on Saturday night at Dodger Stadium. Congratulations to Clayton Kershaw. That was absolutely an incredible thing to see. So congrats to him and the Dodgers and the fan base for the way they reacted. Conrad, that was special, man. Extremely special. I don't I don't know what's cooler though. Like the fact that Kershaw broke it in so many less innings or that Don Sutton threw 3800 pitches. <laughs> that's a good thing you, you know I, i'm gonna take the the innings the the fact that he did it in 2477 innings is is remarkable you hear he breaks the record and i start to thinking man there's been some names 
around that organization. Don Sutton obviously comes to mind. Sandy Koufax. I mean, the, the organization's been around forever. And to have him do it in over a thousand less innings than the leader, the, the, than the previous leader, is remarkable. So I, I'm going to say that, that that stat just jumped off the pages to me. That's remarkable. Absolutely. Now let's move on to second base, a team that we've actually been following pretty closely this year. Had Carlos Correa on two weeks ago. Uh, but the Twins, they're leading the AL Central, and they're so fun to watch. The Minnesota Twins are here at the beginning of May, leading the American League Central. Did we see that coming? No, probably not. But that's the beauty of baseball. You have to play the games. I remember the night that Carlos Correa signed, and it was, why is he going there? Why is he going to Minnesota? They're not ready to win. Well, guess what? They are. And I'm not sitting here right here today saying that the Twins are going to win the American League Central. But I can promise you they got a good chance. Correa wasn't even playing great up to this point. Looks like he's starting to hit his stride now. He's had uh, multiple, a couple multi-hit games in a row now. Um, Byron Buxton out in center field is just an MVP caliber talent. He is unbelievable. Everybody was counting this team out. You look at the pitching staff. That's where the biggest difference has been. Joe Ryan, unbelievable. A rookie. We'll get to him a little bit later on. Um, Dylan Bundy has been good. Under a three ERA in four starts. Bailey Ober, under a three ERA under four in four starts. Chris Archer, under a three ERA? Are you kidding me? So we know... What this offense can do, we've seen it. But this pitching staff isn't getting enough credit. The Minnesota Twins are for real. You sign Carlos Correa, everybody's wondering, are they going to go for it? And they are. Not only are they real, they're really fun. Byron Buxton is unbelievable. Brings the energy every single day. That walk-off moonshot the other day looked like it went 700 feet. That was unbelievable. Correa's had three straight multi-hit games entering Sunday. Eight for 14, five RBIs in his last three games. That's after a slower start. So the Twins were doing this while not even having one of their best players. I'm not going to say their best because Byron Buxton is playing like the best player in the world right now. But Correa's starting to heat up. The Twins started four and eight. And since then, they've gone nine and one in their last 10 games. It's been fun to see. I'm rocking their shirt. Landed 10,000 lakes. Carlos Correa on it. They're for real. People aren't talking about them enough. Obviously, when we talk about the AL Central, people like to look at the White Sox and say, wow, the White Sox are struggling. Let's talk about that Central. Let's talk about the White Sox and their struggles. There's a time and a place for that. But you want to talk about the AL Central, I'll sit here right now and talk about the Minnesota Twins and tell you how good they are. They deserve all the credit in the world. They're playing fantastic. They have some of the best players in the world, Byron Buxton, Carlos Correa. Those are the names we all know. Max Kepler, learn that name. He's becoming, he's becoming a stud in the league. The starting rotation that's full of a bunch of guys that you don't really know has been fantastic. I really like this Minnesota Twins team. They deserve a lot of credit for what they're doing right now in this league, for what they're doing in the AL Central. They have just as good of a chance as the White Sox do at this point of winning that division. Everybody looks at the White Sox and says, that roster on paper, they're so good. The game is played on the field. And what I'm seeing on the field from the Minnesota Twins, that is special. That has been a lot of fun to watch, and they deserve a lot of credit. Absolutely. I mean, anyone that follows baseball as much as what you do and what I do during the season, uh, if you're not watching the Minnesota Twins, what are you doing? Because it seems like every single day they're playing at like even a higher, higher level. And again, you mentioned it really quick, but Byron Buxton, man, uh, I, I watched him play all three games or four games against the Mariners. And I just walked away being like, is this guy the best player in Major League Baseball? I mean, Byron Buxton. I mean, Seriously. people need to learn to know this name. If he's healthy, you're talking about a top five player in Major League Baseball. Yeah, and, and that, that's always the caveat with Byron Buxton of, of if he's healthy. But, yes, I will, I will acknowledge that. That is true. But let's, let's look, let's put that aside. Let's not say if he's healthy. With what we're seeing, Byron Buxton is an MVP 
caliber player. He is so fun to watch. He hits with so much power. He is so fast, and he plays a great center field. Byron Buxton needs more credit for the transformation that he has made in his career. He's always been the fast guy that if he puts the ball in play, he could get on base and steal a bunch of bases. He's not that guy anymore. He still has that potential, but he's also the guy that can hit the ball 450 feet into the fourth deck at target field. Byron Buxton is one of the greatest players in this game right now, and he is a big reason why the Minnesota Twins are as good as they are. So I hear you. He's been plagued with injuries over the course of the last few years, over the course of his career. But let's talk about when he is on the field, how incredible he is. He deserves so much credit for that Twins team being as good as they are and so much credit for transforming himself into the player that he is right now in this moment. It is special. It is so fun to watch. The Twins are the real deal. That's what I'm sitting here saying right now. Oh, Conrad, moving on. Next? That fires to me an- up, man. Fires <laughs> me up. Moving on to another team that seems to be the real deal. The New York Mets had a combined no-hitter last week and uh it's been kind of back and forth on the twitter sphere whether it was an impressive game or not their second career no hitter in franchise history only next to one johan santana uh what do you have on the mets combined no hitter yeah the mets combined no no the second in history the second no hitter in their team's history the first combined no hitter in their team's history It was a lot of fun to watch. Queens was rocking and rolling. The crowd was going nuts. They had a bunch of pitchers involved. Five pitchers were involved in this no-hitter. The most in a combined no-hitter since 2012 when the Mariners did it. But it was fun. It was fun to watch. But let me say this about combined no-hitters. Because this has been a big talking point on social media I brought it up and and put out a poll, which we can show here in a second. But let me say this. Combined no-hitters are awesome. This was the 17th time in history that there has been a combined no-hitter. So less of those than actual no-hitters. But let me say, combined no-hitters are great. They are totally different. They shouldn't even be compared. Like, obviously, we're going to make the comparison But a no-hitter with one pitcher is special. It is incredible. It deserves all of the praise. I am not sitting here right now saying that a combined no-hitter is better than a regular no-hitter or even as close. But it is different, and it is great in its own right. It takes so many pitchers, and in this instance, it takes five different guys, all being on their A game, to complete this all of them that's special you've kept for 27 outs you haven't given up a hit to the other team now i will say a combined no hitter is almost worse on it, it looks worse on the opposing team than a regular no hitter if you have a no hitter if you're no hit by one pitcher that guy is just so locked in it was his day if you're no hit by five different pitchers that, all, that looks worse on your team than, than one guy. But it's equally as impressive for the pitching staff. You have five guys all coming in, all having to be on their A game. The pressure building and building and building. I love combined no-nos. Um, they have their place in history. This is only the 17th in history. It is not. And 10 times out of 10, let me say this. Let me preface it with this. 10 times out of 10, I would rather see a no-hitter by one pitcher. That is unarguably more incredible, more impressive. That is the thing that you want to see when you show up to a ballpark. If it starts happening, obviously the momentum builds, and it shifts a little bit when that pitcher is pulled. But it still should be talked about in a high light. Like, this is special. It really is. 17 in history now. There are only four active franchises that have only pitched one no-hitter in their history, by the way. The Mets have moved on from that list. The Rockies, the Padres, the Rays, and the Blue Jays. We can talk about the Mets' first no-hitter. There's another time, another place for that. If replay was around at that time, 
the Mets might be joining this list of one team. But Johan Santana gets it done. He's in the record books as well. Mets combined no-no, 17th in history. Producer Conrad, what do you got for me there? I think it's impressive, man. I mean, honestly, before the season started and somebody said, Ben, one guy from the New York Mets is going to throw a no-hitter or combine no-hitter. Who do you think the starting pitcher is going to be? And you're looking at DeGrom, Scherzer, Bassett. You would have never guessed that it would have been McGill, too. What do you think the odds would have been before the season to guess that he would have been the first no-hitter out of all those guys for the Mets? Yeah, I mean, it, he's a part of it. Tyler McGill, when, when you hear... Let's say before the season, we were told there's going to be a no-hitter or a combined no-hitter. What starting pitcher starts the game? I'll give you that. There's no way I would have said Tyler McGill, but turns out it was. He throws the first five innings. He's been fantastic this year. Look, we want to talk about the combined no-hitter and talk about how impressive it is, if it's impressive at all, how many times it's been done. Let's talk about McGill and how impressive he has been to start the year. He's been awesome. And now he throws five innings, doesn't give up a hit. Jacob deGrom goes down to start the year. Who are you going to have to step in? It's been him. McGill has been fantastic. Man, but that's a good point. To start the year, who's it going to be? There's a, The Mets end up throwing a no-hitter, combined or not. Who's it going to be? You, you say DeGrom or you say Scherzer. But it's time McGill's in that conversation. He has no-hit stuff. Uh, he gets through five innings of that, but that's a good point there you make, Conrad. Yeah, I was just thinking about it myself. You know, you have that nasty rotation, and that's the guy to get it done for you. But let's move on over to home plate. We're going to stay in New York, though. The Yankees, nine in a row. Let's talk about it. Let's get, let's get it out. Let's air it out. This Yankees team is really good. We are now into May, and the New York Yankees are the best team in Major League Baseball. They started 7-6, and six, the world was ending, and they've rattled off nine in a row. Spare me that it hasn't been against the best teams in the world. I don't care. Winning nine in a row in the fashion that they have is very, very impressive. They've scored over seven runs a game on their nine-game win streak. The offense has awoken. Gary Cole has awoken. Aroldis Chapman's at the back end doing his thing. Look, they start seven and six. Everybody's worried. Everybody's concerned. Everybody's laughing at the Yankees. Their fans are worried. And then they rattle off this nine-game win streak. And the New York Yankees are the best team in baseball. They have the best record in baseball. It has been fun to watch. Everybody in this lineup has seemingly turned it around from a start they were having. Anthony Rizzo is off to a ridiculous start. Reached base in 11 straight games entering Sunday. Aaron Judge on Sunday hit two bombs. Anthony Rizzo is is on fire to start the year. Nine bombs, 21 RBIs, a monster. April, 273. 391 on base percentage, nine home runs, and 21 RBIs for Anthony Rizzo in April. The first baseman that the New York Yankees seemingly fell back on. He was the fallback option from Freeman and Olsen. Well, look what he's doing to start the year. Remarkable. Aaron Judge turned it around, was, I don't want to say struggling out of the gates. The season's still young. But the first, you know, first week or so was a little, little slower for him. Now he's turned it around. Tons of bombs lately. Seven bombs in his last eight games. Unbelievable. Anthony Rizzo, as we just talked about, leading the majors in home runs, fifth in slugging percentage, second in total bases, tied for second in RBIs. This team is fun. DJ LeMahieu heating up. Heading into Sunday, batting 301. Aaron Hicks, 306. Isaiah Kiner Falefa, the shortstop that they end up acquiring kind of a head scratcher amongst a lot of people he's hitting over 300 entering Sunday I mean this team for all the grief they get when they struggle they deserve the praise right now everybody wants to talk about that Blue Jays team in the AL East and they should be talked about but the Yankees are leading that charge 
The Yankees are the best team, the best record in baseball. Entering Sunday, they were third in Major League Baseball in runs per game, second in home runs, second in team ERA, and first in fielding percentage. That's covering the whole spectrum, folks. Hitting, pitching, defense. If you do all those things well, what do you get? Well, you get the best team in baseball. You get the best record, the best winning percentage in baseball. Gary Cole is back over his last two starts, 12 and two-thirds, zero earned runs and 15 punch-outs in his last two starts. We were talking about how good this Yankees rotation was before Gary Cole was even into form. They've been good elsewhere. Everybody else has been picking up the slack. Nasty Nestor, Nestor Cortez, Jordan Montgomery, Severino. Those guys are picking up the slack. Now Gary Cole is rolling, and this team is just complete. Offense, defense, pitching. What is going on in New York City with the Yankees and the Mets is incredible. But this Yankees team, they're the tops in Major League Baseball, and that is pretty impressive to see. Yeah, I mean, I think anybody looking at this Yankees team right now and how they're constructed would be like, yeah, this is a pretty good Yankees team, but we didn't know they were going to be this good like this. I mean, me and you were talking a couple weeks ago, and we're just like, I don't know if the Yankees have it. They're just missing something. It's not like they added anybody or added anything. Joey Gallo's still not hitting to his potential. Like, is this Yankees team a legit contending Yankee squad? I mean, we haven't seen a legit contending Yankee squad in a couple years, but these guys seem to have all the pieces, and they're on nine-game win streak out of nowhere. It's just like, hey, randomly, Yankees won nine straight. It's like, oh, wow, this is impressive. Yeah, look, it's the New York Yankees. We're all used to them getting whatever free agent they want and shelling out all of their money, and that's how they win games, by going to get the Freddie Freemans or the Carlos Correa or the Matt Olson, and that didn't happen. So naturally, the question becomes, okay, well, what, what are we going to be? this year well I'll tell you what you're gonna be you're a team that has Aaron Judge who should be captain who should be the captain of the New York Yankees you have Giancarlo Stanton former MVP you have Garrett Cole I mean DJ LeMahieu is a perfect fit in that lineup he's he's a high average guy everybody else drives the ball out of the yard you have Joey Gallo who obviously struggling but when he gets when he gets hot, he can be one of the best hitters in baseball. I'm excited. I, I love watching him when he gets hot. That's what the Yankees are. Okay, so yeah, they didn't go get the big star. They had the pieces already to win. Then you bring in a Josh Donaldson who brings a grit, a fire, a passion, an energy to the team. He was a perfect fit. And then you bring in guys that can help defensively, Kiner Falefa, who's been doing well offensively. So yes. This is a different Yankee. This team is run differently than we've expected. Than the, different than the Yankees that I grew up watching. That would just buy their way to whatever they wanted to get done. Than the late 90s, early 2000s Yankees. This is different. They believed in the team they had on the field. They believed it was capable of winning. They added a couple of pieces. Rizzo, Donaldson, Kiner Falefa. That they believed were the perfect fit. To bring it all together. And as of the beginning of May through April, how are you going to argue with it? It's been great. Now they're off and running. The superstars are being superstars. The, the role players are, are doing incredible at it. So yeah, I like what this Yankees team is. They have all the capability of winning. They have the firepower that they need to to win. The sky is the limit for this team. When they're hot, they're really hot. But when the Yankees are cold, they can be really cold. But they have the potential to be just as good. And they, at the end of April, had the best record in all of Major League Baseball. But speaking of the best record, are they the top team on my power rankings? Because they haven't been yet this year. Never have been, in fact, since I've started in this industry. And it is now the beginning of May. So let's get to it. Let's get to our top power rankings in major league baseball april is done it is the beginning of may and it is time for my top 10 mlb power rankings let's start with number 10 the st louis cardinals the cardinals 
Got off to a really good start. Arenado looks to be in MVP-like form. Went through a little bit of a scuffle, but ended up having a good last series of the week. Big come from behind win on Sunday, but they look better. They look good this year. They are at number 10 on my rankings. At number nine, the Minnesota Twins. That's right. The Twins are appearing in my power rankings for the first time this season. Who saw this coming? Correa signs there, but Buxton ends up being incredible. Correa is starting to play better. Joe Ryan is looking awesome on the mound. Max Kepler looking good in the outfield. The Minnesota Twins are the real deal in the AL Central. They are so much fun to watch. At number nine, I have the Minnesota Twins. At number eight, the San Diego Padres. Manny Machado, speaking of MVP-like form, Manny Machado has been incredible this year. I said it at the beginning of the year. Tatis is down. They need somebody to pick up the slack. You don't think Machado's that guy to pick up the slack because he's already really good. He has gone to another level this year. Manny Machado has been fantastic. This team's been playing good ball. They had a good series against the Dodgers. They ended up losing two of three. But it just shows the top of the top, the cream of the crop that they're playing, they can compete with them. The Padres have looked good all year long. They are at number eight in my power rankings. Number seven, the Milwaukee Brewers. It's that pitching staff for me. Corbin Burns, Brandon Woodruff, Freddie Peralta just absolutely lights out. They haven't even completely gotten into form yet. Woodruff hasn't been as good as I know he will be. And then you start looking at the lineup that finally has started to hit. That was the thing at the beginning of the year. Okay, we know they can pitch, but are they going to score? Willie Adamas is now hot. He's rolling. Christian Yelich, is he back? It looks like Yelich is back. He's been swinging the bat well. Uh, I, I like this team. I like them a lot. And if they are hitting, I mean, then then look out. Because then they have the pitching rotation, they have the lineup, and then they have the back end of the bullpen. That no Nobody has a better 8-9 in the bullpen than the Brewers and Devin Williams and Josh Hader. Just, it just doesn't happen. At number six, we have the San Francisco Giants. They just keep doing it. They just keep finding a way to win ball games and to compete in the NL West. When everybody says, look, it's been two years of this now. Last year, okay, the Giants are just off to a good start. Like, they'll, they'll falter. They'll, they'll slide down the rankings. Now this year, okay, well, they're just not as good of a team this year. There's no way. Last year was a fluke. They just continue to prove that it is a culture in San Francisco. It is something special they are doing there and that they are a really good team, and it's time you get on board with it. The San Francisco Giants at number six. Number five, the Los Angeles Angels. That's right, the Angels have cracked the power rankings, and they have jumped all the way up to number five. Let's look at it. Mike Trout is, is Mike Trout this year. It's been incredible to watch him. Taylor Ward is unbelievable in that lineup. Brandon Marsh has been good. Shohei Otani hasn't even gone crazy at the plate yet. You have to believe he'll get a little more consistent and take off at the plate. Anthony Rendon hasn't been great. Walsh hasn't. The lineup has been incredible with a lot of guys not even producing at the best of their ability. But then you look at that starting rotation. I mean, Syndergaard, Bundy, Suarez, I mean, Lorenzen, are you kidding me? This team is good. This team is really, really good. And the back end of the bullpen, Rysel Iglesias, I, I like this Angels team a lot. They are debuting here on the power rankings, and they are jumping all the way up to number five. At number four, I have the Los Angeles Dodgers. A little bit of a bump down. Um, the lineup's just not clicking on all cylinders right now. You got a lot of guys struggling. Uh, I was there at the game on Saturday when they lost to the Detroit Tigers. At this point in the year, the Tigers are struggling. You got to be sleeping them. When they're not playing well, when you're at home and you're the Dodgers, you should be sleeping the Tigers. They lost a series to the Diamondbacks. So look, they're still really good. I just bumped them down a little bit in my power rankings. They are at number four. At number three, the Toronto Blue Jays. They haven't lost a series yet this year. They are really good. They are really fun. They have played some very fun, very exciting games against the Houston Astros, who 
haven't started the year off great, but we all know when all is said and done, the Astros will have their name in the picture. They will be good. And perhaps a future ALCS matchup, the Blue Jays and the Astros. That would be a lot of fun. Blue Jays at number three. At number two, the New York Mets. The Mets have been an elite team to start the year. They've been doing it all. Pitching, hitting, the bullpen's been good. Edwin Diaz at the back end of the bullpen is so much fun to watch. This team is real. The Mets are going to Met no longer. Get it out of your vocabulary. This is a different team. This is a fun team to watch. They do it in all different way, shapes, and forms. The Mets are at number two. Now let me say this. We are recording on Sunday for our Monday show. The Mets are the last game of the week. Mets, Phillies going on right now. It is Sunday night baseball. So if the Mets end up losing that game, don't be surprised if on my Monday official release on social media of the power rankings, they slide down a spot or a two. But if they win, they will be right here at the number two spot. But number one on my power rankings, I just talked about them, just gave them a bunch of love. The New York Yankees are the best team in baseball. After all the doubt, after all the frustration with a little bit slower of a start, the New York Yankees are rolling. They're doing it all. Judge on another level right now. Rizzo looks incredible. Gary Cole is back. 2-0 in his last two starts. No earned runs. 15 punch outs. And he wasn't even the guy that, that was the reason this rotation was so good. The New York Yankees rotation has been great this year, and it's because of the other guys. It's because of the 2-3-4 in the rotation. Nasty Nestor Cortez has been great. Jordan Montgomery, good. But Garrett Cole's supposed to be that guy for this rotation, and he's back to being that guy. So you have all your superstars doing superstar-like things. Aaron Judge, make him the captain of the Yankees. Garrett Cole, they're rolling. Nine in a row, nine wins in a row. The New York Yankees have been incredible. They are the number one team in my power rankings. One and two being the Yankees and the Mets. This is only the third season that the Yankees and Mets each finished the month of April in first place. It also happened in 1976 and 1986. In 76, the Yankees went to the World Series. They lost to the Reds. In 86, the Mets went to the World Series and they beat the Red Sox. And now again, so which one of them is going to the World Series? I don't know, but it's certainly a possibility. Could we get a Subway Series? That's certainly a possibility as well. But the New York Yankees round out my top 10 of my Major League Baseball power rankings for this week. Always a good time. Always a good talking point at the beginning of the week that gets the people going. That's what I like right now. Producer Conrad, where are we going next? You know what, Ben? Everybody loves a little bit of way too early season awards. You know, we just finally got through April. We're head on into May, and everybody is wondering, who is the cream of the crop in Major League Baseball? Who is Ben's way too early season award winners? Let's start in the American League. AL MVP, Mike Trout. Mike Drop. Enough said. You're right. Everybody is, Everybody has been wondering and clamoring for April MLB awards. And that's what we're here to do. And the April MVP of Major League Baseball is Mike Trout. 323, a 1.141 OPS in the month of April. I mean, he's back. He's Mike Trout. He's healthy. He's having fun. Every single at bat right now is must-watch TV. I mean, even his outs are hard hit. Even his foul balls are crushed. I've been watching him play pretty much every single game, and it is remarkable what he is doing right now. So there's a few different directions right now that you could have gone with for April MVP in the American League. But look, you can't ever go wrong with Mike Trout. And in my opinion, he is the AL MVP after April. Yeah, I don't think anyone is going to have anything to say about that because Mike Trout is definitely back. Let's move on to A.L. Cy Young. This one made my heart very happy to see Logan Gilbert absolutely dominating stuff. 
And then especially after he put on another great performance against the Marlins today. But Logan Gilbert, what do you have on Logie? L- Logan Gilbert. Did you was that a Logie you just threw in there? Did you did you just give him that nickname? You like that? I don't like that. We're not we're gonna call him Logan. I'm gonna call him Logan. Logan Gilbert was incredible in the month of April. He is my April Cy Young Award winner. He has all the stuff JP Crawford was saying. Uh, just on Sunday after the game, that he has figured it out and he is pitching with confidence. <laughs> just watch out if he's pitching with confidence. He has been electric this year through April. So he threw at the beginning of May. He threw May 1st. But his April stats, three wins, an ERA under 0.4. <laughs> That's just wild. A whip well under one as well. Logan Gilbert through the first month of the year in April, is my Cy Young Award winner. He has been fantastic. You absolutely love to see this kind of love for Logan Gilbert. I definitely didn't see him having a year like this, only his second year in late Major League Baseball. But hey, you're way too early AL Cy Young winner. I'll take it. Let's move on to AL Rookie of the Year, Joe Ryan. Look, Joe Ryan has been fantastic. He was even in consideration for AL Cy Young Award winner to this point. He was the opening day starter for the Minnesota Twins and has just been lights out. 3-1 and one on the year with a 1.17 ERA, 25 Ks, and a whip of 0.70. That is really, really good. Joe Ryan has been awesome. I remember opening day was coming and everybody's going, the Twins are starting a Joe Ryan on opening day? Well, look how that's worked out. Clearly, he has been fantastic. He looks awesome. This was an easy one for me. Yeah, Jeremy Pena out in Houston has been playing great, but Joe Ryan has been absolutely lights out. He is my rookie of the year through April in the American League. So that rounds out our American League side of things. Conrad, let's head on over to the National League. Yeah, let's start with the National League MVP. We've talked a lot about him before, but... You did leave him off your top third baseman list earlier this year. Manny Machado, NL MVP. Manny Machado through April is my MVP. I mean, he has been incredible. And I talked about it a little while ago. Somebody needed, and, and, and multiple people needed, to pick up the slack for Fernando Tatis being out of the lineup. I said, if this team can tread water until Tatis comes back, They can be the real deal under Bob Melvin. Well, Manny Machado has been more than enough picking up the slack. He's already a great player. I wasn't even looking at him. He's picked up everybody else's slack. He is carrying this team. 386, a 1.067 OPS in April. He has been incredible. This is like like Manny Machado of, of the Orioles, Manny Machado. I mean... He is raking. Unbelievable. This was a tough decision, though. There's some tough, there's some competition over there in the National League. Nolan Arenado certainly came to mind, and it was a tough decision. But Manny Machado right now, especially because of the slack he is picking up of Tatis, MVP through April. All right, let's move on to NL Cy Young. Pablo Lopez from the Miami Marlins. Former Mariner, you're welcome, Miami. This Marlins pitching staff is unbelievable. And Pablo Lopez so far this year, 3-0 in April. Get this, a 0.39 ERA. Pablo Lopez's 0.39 ERA is the lowest in Marlins history through four starts in a season, surpassing 2004 Dontrell Willis, Fox guy Dontrell Willis with his 0.71 <laughs> and 23 Ks. Are, are you kidding me? 0.39, Pablo Lopez. There is no other answer right now in the National League. There isn't. He's unbelievable. That pitching staff is going to be really good for a really long time. And this wasn't even a name at the start of the year that everybody was talking about. Everyone likes to talk about um, Sergio Alcantara and all the the other guys, okay? Edward Cabrera, 
But Pablo Lopez, oh my God, it's been unbelievable. He is my Cy Young winner so far through April. Last but not least, NL Rookie of the Year, and I think this is a pretty unanimous one, Seiya Suzuki. He's been just absolutely outstanding for the Chicago Cubs. Yeah, Seiya Suzuki's been great. Coming over from Japan, just immediately tearing up the league. Um, it's a tough transition to make, no matter which way you're going, from Japan to Major League Baseball or from Major League Baseball to Japan. It is a tough transition. The pitching is just different. I've had friends do both of them. And, and it's a tough thing to just immediately adjust. He has come over and just immediately adjusted. Four homers, an OPS of .934. He's been incredible. He doesn't swing and miss much. He doesn't strike out a lot. He's doing it all. He's flipping his bat. You know we love that here. The name of our show is Flipping Bats. So, any, you, you know, I love it. Say a Suzuki. This was the easiest decision of them all. So far, my rookie of the year for the month of April is Seiya Suzuki in the National League. So that rounds out. Look, you all have been waiting. My way too early awards to give away after April. That wraps them up. We will do that. Hey, maybe we'll do it after every month. All right, and now it is time for my favorite segment this week in Shohei Otani news. I'm going to talk about how his start the other day was the most impressive start of the year. I'm going to talk about Shohei Otani in the batter's box and how he's struggling to find his stride a little bit. How I think Shohei is the most dynamic and versatile hitter in baseball and his speed. It is just always on display. But let's start with that start of his the other day. Last Wednesday, in my opinion, was Shohei Otani's most impressive game of the season. Now I hear you. His start on the mound before, just one week prior, he was almost perfect. He had a perfect game going. But last Wednesday was more impressive for me. Why? Shohei didn't have his best stuff on the mound by any means. The first inning was a struggle. Gives up a homer, gives up two runs. He did not have his good stuff, but he powered through. Goes back out for that second inning. Does not have his best stuff. His fastball command all over the place. His slider wasn't near as good as it was in Houston when he punched out 12 guys, but he found a way to get out of that inning. And with every passing inning, you could see it. He got better and better and better. That is so hard and so impressive to be able to do in the middle of a start when you do not have your A stuff on the mound, not even your B or maybe even C stuff, to figure it out, to pitch through it, and to get your stuff back throughout the outing. On the mound, in my opinion, that was more impressive than when he did have his A stuff. We all know what Shohei Otani is capable of doing when he has his A stuff. It's what he did in Houston. He punched out 12 guys, he gave up one hit, and he didn't, he didn't give up a run. He was almost perfect. But it's what he was able to do, the way he was able to adjust when he didn't have his best stuff. That was incredible in my opinion. And then at the plate, in the first inning, he doesn't get a hit. Later in the game, he doesn't get a hit. He goes 0 for 2, okay? So at the plate, he's not off to a great start. Two of the exact same thing. Two rollovers to the second baseman, almost on the same pitch, looked the exact same. But he made the adjustment at the plate. That third at bat, he gets a very similar pitch and he stays inside of it, rifles a ball up the middle. That was an incredible adjustment. That is not easy to do. Let me tell you, when I used to hit, when I was 0 for 2 at the plate, I typically ended up 0 for 4. Why? Because it's just tough to make in-game adjustments. And when you don't feel good, when you're struggling at the plate, well, it's tough to make that adjustment in-game. He did it that third at bat, that fourth at bat, absolutely rifled a double to right field. Just shows you how much he locked in. Ends up getting three hits on the night. So this is why I say it was the most impressive start. I will not say it was his best or most dominant game, because I don't think it was. I think his game on Wednesday of last, week, of last week was the most impressive start. His ability to adjust is second to none. It was incredible. You see starters all the time that don't have their best stuff, 
They give up a couple runs, and even if they get out of that inning, they just continue to pitch with not their best stuff, and they don't have a good outing. He figured out how to have a good outing, five innings, two runs, a quality start in the books, with figuring out how to get his best stuff. It was incredible. What a start, an impressive game, and that's what makes Shohei Shohei, in my opinion. Now let's talk about his hitting. He is trying to find his stride to this point. And I will not hear, Shohei, he's been awful at the plate. Well, he hasn't. It's been a little up and down to this point. But look, over the course of the last week, he's, he hit 308 last week with a homer and two RBIs. So he's doing at the plate what he was able to do on the mound the other night and make adjustments. He's trying to figure it out. He hasn't quite hit that stride that we know Shohei can, but he's figuring out ways to get through it and adjust when he doesn't have his best stuff, when he's not feeling his best at the plate. But a good week, coming off a good week with another homer, batted 308. I see something at the plate with Shohei, and I, and I saw it in that Sunday game against the White Sox when he came up with the bases loaded and they had just walked Mike Trout. He got a pitch. A curveball, a big loopy curveball that at no point was a strike. At no point. He ended up swinging, grounds out to first base. In my opinion, I think he is pressing a little bit to be even better. Even better than he was last year when he was the unanimous MVP. To be that guy, this team is playing good. Trout is back. Shohei needs to be better than ever. He doesn't need to be. Shohei just needs to be Shohei. That Shohei is good enough. So I think he needs to just relax. Let himself be himself. Not press about doing too much at the plate. We saw it last week. He was able to hit over 300 on the week. So as much as everybody says, well, what's, what's going on? Nothing. He's working through it on his own. He's figuring out. He's getting his hits. His hits are coming in bunches right now. Yes, he'll have a couple games in a row where he doesn't give a hit. Get a hit, but then that next day he'll get three hits. Shohei is fine. It's just going to be about finding that stride for him. He's not in it yet. Finding that consistency that I know he will. And soon enough, he'll be off and running, hitting better, more consistent. But coming off a good, a good week, average-wise, gets a bomb. I love it. He will find his stride soon enough. That leads me into my next point. Shohei was leading off every game to start the year. He wasn't firing on all cylinders by any stretch of the imagination to start the year out of the leadoff spot. So what do they do? Well, they move him all around. He's now hit second. He's hit third. And the other night when he hit a home run, he was batting cleanup. It is remarkable, and there aren't a lot of players around Major League Baseball that you can feel comfortable batting leadoff, and he's just as fast as any leadoff hitter out there. And you can bat him in the cleanup spot. And he can hit with more power than anybody. He is so versatile. And when you hear Shohei Otani and you hear dynamic, versatile, you think, yeah, he is pitching and hitting. Yeah, I can talk about that all day long and I typically do. He's also dynamic just from a hitting perspective. He literally can hit anywhere in a lineup and do that well. He's a, he can be a good leadoff hitter, he can make contact, he can get on base, he can be fast, or he can hit in the four hole and hit bombs and outslug everybody. It has been incredible this year when he's not off to his typical, like, hot, getting a hit every game start to watch him be plugged into a different place in the lineup and to see him produce. It's not easy to do that. It's not. That's often why you'll, why you'll see managers hit a player in the same spot all year long. It's not the same. It is difficult hitting in different spots in the lineup. And he's been able to do that, and he's been able to do it well. He is obviously the most dynamic player in baseball because he can hit and he can pitch. But offensively, he's also one of the most dynamic players, which leads me to my last point, his speed. A whole other topic that we don't even talk about as much as we should with Shohei. He is one of the fastest players in Major League Baseball. And he has been showing off the wheels so far this year. Gets a stolen base the other night, and I love this. This was great. The White Sox picked over, tried to pick him off what seemed like 10 times in a row. 
Shohei was even laughing. We're showing the video. If you're watching this via video, you can see it. They picked off so many times in a row. Shohei couldn't help but smiling and laughing. And you know what he did to follow it up? He stole second base. Almost immediately. Steals second base. Ball ends up going out into the outfield. He takes third on that as well. Just showing off the wheels. Has four stolen bases already on the year, which is good for top five in the American League. He just does it all. He absolutely does it all. And that is what, that's the whole premise behind this segment. Yes, I love him. I love Shohei. I'm his number one fan. But there's legitimately something that he is doing every single week that is worthy of talking about. If he's not hitting well, he's pitching well. If he's not pitching well, he's hitting well. And if he's not doing any of that, he's stealing a bunch of bags and having fun doing it. But the beauty of this, the beauty of all of it, is he's typically doing it all well at the exact same time. And that's what makes him so special. That's why I love having this segment. And that is it for this week's This Week in Shohei Otani News. All right, and to wrap up today's show, a little extra inning segment, something that sticks out to me or means a lot or a little sentimental moment, whatever it may be, every Monday show I like to end with a little extra inning segment. And this week's, is Ben Joyce of the University of Tennessee throwing the hardest pitch ever in college baseball, 105.5 miles an hour. The hardest pitch ever recorded, breaking the record. (laughs) Absolutely mind-blowing. And it actually got me to thinking about the all-time record, including Major League Baseball, because it had to be close. So what I found was that Aroldis Chapman has the hardest pitch ever thrown at 105.8. Now, it originally registered at 105.1, and that's what is in the Guinness Book of World Records. Now, apparently that got changed or updated to 105.8. A little discrepancy there, but whatever it may be, he did officially break the all-time college record, 105. Point five miles an hour. Listen to this tweet. The adjusted official numbers from that outing for Ben Joyce. Today, Vols Ben Joyce threw three pitches at 105 miles an hour or better, 15 pitches at 104 miles an hour or better, and 28 pitches at 103 or better. Of his 33 fastballs, 28 were 103 or better. That is unheard of. That is remarkable. Congratulations to Ben Joyce. I also wanted to talk about, I tweeted about this, and a lot of the replies are, well, he's going to blow out his elbow. He he won't be pitching in two years. I wanted to talk about that before I finish up. I don't want to hear that. This guy is doing something that has never been done before. It is absolutely incredible. I tweeted about that. If you're responding to Ben Joyce throwing 105.5 and all you can say is, well, he'll blow out in a couple of years anyway, stop doing that. Tom House retweeted me. The legend, Tom House, might I add. A great Twitter follow. If, if you ever heard of Nolan Ryan, his pitching coach as well. Just a legend in the business. He retweeted me and said, Marvel in the athleticism. Talent and hard work is what it takes to do this. Predicting someone is going to get injured is toxic and lazy. I agree. Say, you know what, this is incredible. I hope he can stay healthy. But don't say, eh, whatever, he'll blow out in a couple of years anyway. It is incredible. I needed to talk about what Ben Joyce of the University of Tennessee did, breaking the all-time record for hardest pitch ever thrown in college. Absolutely incredible. I can't wait to watch him at the next level. But that does it for this week's episode of Flippin' Bats. This has been a blast. We had a lot to cover first episode of the week. We will be back on Wednesday with a guest episode, a guest interview. Make sure you guys are followed and subscribed wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it be Apple, Spotify, Google, whatever it is. Subscribe to it. That really helps. Rate it five stars. Scroll down. Rate it. All that good stuff. We also have all social media. So if you're listening, you want to follow along on social media at Flippin' Bats Pod on Twitter, 
Instagram, and every episode. You can watch the video on YouTube at Flippin' Bats Pod as well. This has been a blast, and I will see you guys Wednesday for another episode of Flippin' Bats. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you love Flippin' Bats, Swingin' 3-0, or just talking ball, join us. Call us at 213-537-9339 with your questions. We have a weekly guest, and we have a lot of fun, so hit that subscribe button.